and we're live. Hello, welcome back. Sorry we had a technical difficulty there with the change in the new Facebook formatting. Anyways, I will start over. So welcome to Soiree Lifestyle Series 2020. Thank you for joining our group and growing our community. Please say hello to us in the comment section and let us know that you're here. Also use the comment section for questions or comments for our guest speakers. The purpose of our group is to share valuable information in featured weekly segments with professionals in the respective fields around uh, lifestyles, relationships, and entertaining. I am Rosemary Skinner, a professional event and wedding planner and event designer and owner of Soiree Event Extraordinaire. My hosts, Crystal Cottle Sullivan, uh, uh, Cynthia Ballard, and John Sullivan. Today's episode 25, we will be featuring our topic around relationships. We are honored, thankful, and grateful for our very important guest speakers today. Welcome Dr. Harvel Hendricks and Dr. Helen LaKelly Hunt. Dr. Hendricks and Dr. Hunt are internationally respected couple therapists, educators, speakers, and New York Times bestselling authors. Together, they have written over 10 books with more than 4 million copies sold, including the timeless classic, Getting the Love You Want, a guide for couples. In addition, Harville has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey television program 17 times. The pair are also the co-creators of the Imago Relationship Theory and Therapy, as well as Safe Conversation, an organization that contributes to the creation of a relational culture through the distribution of new insights from the relational sciences. Welcome to our show. We know that our guests, our guests our, and viewers will be immensely, uh, will, will benefit immensely from both of your expertise. I want to just share a quote from Oprah Winfrey that appeared in her 2005 issue of the O Oprah Magazine. <clears throat> her top 20 moments and her number two aha moment, she wrote, The Imago the Theory, 1988. My big light bulb moment on relationships came for the first time I talked with marriage therapist, Harville Hendricks. He introduced me to, this Imago, to his Imago Theory, in essence, he says, it's not a coincidence that you have attracted your partner. That person is there to help you do the work of recovering from old wounds. The show cho changed me. I saw relationships not solely as a kind of romantic pursuit our society celebrates, but as a spiritual partnership that's meant to change how you see yourself and the world. And that was from Oprah Winfrey. And I just want to make a little side note that Oprah had, submi had submitted that particular show to the Emmys and it actually won an, an Emmy for that show that Dr. Hendricks appeared on. So that's pretty, pretty big. And, and I know it's got, and it's obviously 17 more times you appeared on the show. So that is exciting. And it's exciting to have you here. And then another comment from one of our viewers, she had left because she couldn't watch the show live. And she's a coach in our city. And it was from Tina Marie Brigley. And she wrote, this is an incredible gift to give to your audience. These people don't know it, but they transformed my marriage. Thanks for the book recommendation, John. So welcome again, um, Helen and uh, Harville. We are so excited to have you on the show. I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, John Sullivan, who is going to be our moderator for the show. So thank you again, for everyone, for joining us. And let's turn it over to our experts. I don't know about the expert, but anyway, it's great to have you both, uh, Harville and Helen. Uh, I go back. Uh, to 1989, actually, uh, when I trained with Harville. Uh, and I have to say, uh, Harville and Helen, that uh, you, you transformed my life too, because uh, those of you who know my story, uh, Crystal and I separated after 15 years of marriage. It was over. And uh, we had two kids. We were meeting regarding the kids. But uh, it was really my wife, Crystal, who read the book first. And one of the points they make is that what often happens in our culture is we get rid of our partner, but we keep the problem. And that just made sense to us. So she asked me if we would work on the relationship just so we wouldn't repeat the patterns in, the, if, in another relationship. And four months later, we were back together. Two months later, we went down to Chicago to a workshop Harville gave. And then I said, this guy makes a ton of sense. So I went to New York and trained with him. And then two years later, I went back to train to the workshops. Now, my claim to fame, Harville, is I think I'm the uh, first international guy you trained. I don't know. I don't know. I just say that anyway. But now it's in 53 countries. And I tell my couples, it's not just uh, it's not just me. He sold over four million copies of the book, and he's trained twenty five hundred of us around the world doing this. So it's a it's a great gift, and I, I just am, am so happy. So I take the approach of a coach. Um, 
therapy for me is pretty heavy, but as a coach, I've done lots of coaching and typically there's nothing wrong with my players, but sometimes what they're doing is not working. And I, I think the same is true of relationships. So the way I like to introduce the it to Harville is I, I believe, and I truly do, that the two of you have, uh, the analogy I use, you've cracked the code on relationships. Wow. And for me, it's like having a combination lock. Once you know the combination, much easier to open the lock. Hmm. And I think there's five key pieces, you know, that the past affects the present, the importance of safety, the safe conversations process, the space between, zero negativity. If people can get a handle on those five things, much better chance to have the kind of relationship they want. Uh, and I, on my business card, it says the tools are available in today's world to have the relationship of your dreams. And I truly believe that. But it, you're the guys who uh, put it out there. So I, I really, really appreciate it. Anyway, that's enough of me. What I, what I want you to do, maybe the both of you, or just sort of uh, walk us through the, the evolution of your, of your thinking from way back to, to now, because I, I trained with you in 89. I know there's been an evolution. And even in, in, from 2008 to 2018, the third edition of your book, there's been some shifts especially around the space between, which to me is huge. But anyway, if you can talk to some of that, please. Well, I'd like to start way back, uh, given that we, uh, in our socializing, said some things about uh, Catholicism, uh, which is that the actually first uh, lectures on relationships were a response to a nun in, uh, here in Dallas, when I was on the faculty at Perkins, uh, who came to my office and said that she wanted to take my course, but since she was a nun and didn't have any money, she didn't want to pay. First of all, said to her that I thought the Roman Catholic Church was very wealthy and that <laughs> was enormously impressive to me. And she said, well, but uh, nuns, uh, by definition, uh, you know, are uh, take vows of poverty. So I said, okay, um, you actually can't be registered through the course uh, without paying, and you'd have to go through the university. But I, but if you don't care to have credit for the course, uh, I'll just sneak you in, and you can come in and take the course, and only you and I will know your status. And she said, great, I don't need credit. I just want the content. And when I clarified with her why, why she wanted the content, she uh, was working with the divorced and separated and divorced Roman Catholics. And she was, her name was Sister Josephine. And she created an international organization in the Catholic Church to minister to separated and divorced Roman Catholics. And she herself thought that the church's position on, on uh, separated and divorced Roman Catholics should be, um, well, uh, privately she said it was wrong and publicly she said it needed to be modified. <laughs> but she began to invite me to the conferences that she was holding for them and wanted me to talk to them about uh, relationships. And so it was there that I actually cut my teeth on uh, pulling together what I then knew, which wasn't a whole lot, about uh, how people get into relationships. We'd gotten into that there's something unconscious about the attractive process. And that I think the, uh, uh, the second thing was that relationships have stages. And uh, the first one is romance. The second one is disillusionment and the power struggle. And the third one is uh, <clears throat> separation and divorce, which is where, where the audience was. And I lectured for her in small and large uh, places uh, for a long time. And then began that th those lectures began to uh, be picked up by, at that time I was still on the faculty at, at SMU in the Department of Theology in the School of Theology, uh, began to be picked up by Protestant churches. And I began to go to singles classes at Protestant churches talking about relationships. And those classes sometimes were 10 to 40 people and sometimes some of the huge churches was up to a thousand. So I got started there. And in that early, those early stages, Helen and I met <clears throat> at a party that neither one of us wanted to go to. I think we <laughs> given up on, uh, we were divorced and we were giving up on uh, 
<clears throat> at least I was giving up on this whole dating thing. I mean, I'm, I'm too old to date and it, it hadn't gone very well. But I went to this party with a friend of mine uh, to, to comfort him and, on, and said I was gonna leave in an hour. So I was on my way out the door <clears throat> and Helen uh, walked through the door. She was at this party and she'd come from down the hallway and walked through the door. So we met, she introduced herself uh, and, uh, and I, um, I um, her name was familiar and, I, and she said that she had been in a class that I taught at SMU, but it was a huge class and the room had two doors and then she always came in and left from the back door. So I had never seen her, uh, but she had been in the class, it was a tr class at that time on transactional analysis that I was teaching at the university. So that's how we got connected. And then we started, and you can pick up here whenever you want to, we, we started seeing each other, uh, not quite dating, but seeing and talking and so forth. And we immediately found ourselves in a very intense relationship, except it was negative. Um, and so, so one time we, were, we, we came in and we were in a huge fight. We went, and went to Helen's uh, house and uh, she said, hey, stop. <laughs> one of us talked. And the other one, listen. And as we look back on it, uh, the impact of that regulated our interactions so that we did say, okay, well, you talk, I'll listen, and then I'll talk and you listen. But we didn't do any mirroring. We just regulated what we said. And so I noticed this slowed us down. And I was in a clinical practice with couples. And I decided, and I was doing typical John uh, problem solving stuff, you know, um, looking for solutions, conflict resolution, improve your communication, but not helping them talk to each other. So I began to ask couples to talk to each other. And through that process, and it's too long a story to tell here, couples began to teach me what was valuable about this. First of all, they liked the fact that instead of them talking to me, that I regulated them talking to each other. That was the beginning of the dialogue process. And they said um, over time that they needed uh, more than mirroring. They wanted to be validated and they wanted to be empathized with. And that ultimately led to this three-step process that we call uh, Imago Dialogue, which became the therapeutic intervention. And then now we are taking <laughs> this, uh, this technology to the public from the clinic to the public, where we call it safe conversations dialogue as a part of a social movement. And so maybe I could add that, yeah, when uh, when I met Harville, the, <clears throat> the dialogue wasn't there uh, no. yet, or a lot of the Avago theory wasn't, the, some of the theory was there, phase one, romance, phase two, romance is always followed by the power struggle. Get over it. If you're struggling, that's <clears throat> what it's supposed to be because number three is real love. If you struggle in the right way, the two of you can achieve your dream relationship. So this is what this guy was tinkering with when I met him. And um, uh, two things, John, I love how you call yourself a coach because that's what you can do. The, uh, a, a, a neuroscientist said to me in the 1990s, for the first time in the history of the world with the breakthroughs in the neurosciences that the brain is its neuros, neuroplasticity, that you can teach people how to have a healthy relationship. Before that, in the decades and centuries before, love was important. But if you fell out of love, you couldn't be taught how to get back in love. I mean, you go, okay, trust God, or you could say something gay, you know, God wants you to stay married, so figure it out. <laughs> That's all you could say, and I'll pray for you, but go home and figure it out. Now, someone like John can coach you, because like he said, there are just a few little things you have to learn. And also, I really appreciate John and Crystal the way you all say, hey, we can coach you into having a great relationship. You know what? We almost divorced and we did a couple things and now we're together forever. And that's what happened to Harville and me too. I fell in love with this guy and he wanted to write a book. 
And when he told me about the book he wanted to write, I thought, oh my goodness. And I proposed to him, the book got written, lo and behold, Oprah called, but then it became world famous, but we were not doing it at home. We too almost divorced and we announced our family. We were so, divorcing. So you, so you admit you were not doing it at home. I was not. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I you said we. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We did, we weren't. And now I guess what? We added zero negativity and that saved our marriage. And anyway, now we will spend the rest of the time talking about what is it that kept Crystal and John together and what kept us together? Because it is really awesome being married to this guy. And I would say it's awesome being married to this guy. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> but I remember, I remember years ago, Harville, you said that uh, Helen has has dethroned the therapist. Because traditionally, you go to therapy, it's the therapist. And, and you turned it around and said, no, it's the two of you. You got to learn to talk to each other and solve stuff. And I, I, that's always stuck in my head. And say what the problem is, and then what's the solution to the problem? Therapist doesn't know. Don't have a clue. To ask each other, you know, well, we have something called a convert a frustration into a request. Here's my frustration. And here's what would solve the frustration. Would you be willing with either request? Would you do this? That's an example of a way to the couple can begin to heal each other if yeah. they listen. Yeah, and that's the um, uh, dethroning the therapist. Actually, Helen did come up with that phrase when, when it got clear over uh, at some years. Uh, you know, would, instead of we're talking now about 40 years, at least 40 years ago when 1977 when Helen met and the two years prior to that was when I was working uh, for the um, Sister Josephine and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, that uh, the therapy model is that the uh, therapist relationship to the person or to the couple uh, is important in the healing process. And what got clear to us was that that energy between the therapist and the couple should be moved over between the partners so that the, the relationship that therapists develop with a couple, the therapist should help the partners and the relationship develop that uh, relationship with each other. One of, you know, listening and understanding and talking and deepening. So uh, Helen came up when she saw that, said, you know, you've moved the therapist off the throne. The therapist is now a facilitator, a coach, but uh, not a therapist, but what we discovered is that it actually deepened the coaching process, deepened the therapeutic experience of the partners, because they need to learn how to talk to each other, not not understand themselves better. That's okay to understand yourself better and to understand your childhood and to understand, <clears throat> you know, why you react to this and why you react to that. But unless you can actually move from understanding into particular kind of interaction so that you uh, create safety in the interaction and, um, and can connect around the interaction, you actually don't improve your marriage. We call it now, John, we have a new term called relational competency. So that what we want people to do, couples in their relationship, whether they see themselves on a therapeutic journey or on a coaching journey, they need to become relationally competent. And that's a quality, a capacity that is not marketed in, uh, in the public domain and in the mental health field. What's marketed is uh, um, emotional um, well-being, uh, insight, self-understanding, and all of the things that have to do with a person becoming more aware of and conscious of themselves. And we are happy with all that, but what we found was it doesn't make a whole lot of change in the quality of the interactive space to know yourself better unless you actually behave in a different way. And that's when the change begins to occur. It's when you move from insight to action that you change the quality of the relationship. And you can understand that this relationship is dangerous, but unless you can make it safe, then your understanding that it's dangerous doesn't give you uh, any, uh, any qualitative improvement. 
That's oh. been a big shift for you, hasn't it? The, the shift from the uh, individual to the relation, the relationship, right? That's exactly. that's huge. That the relationship is where life is lived, and the individual is in fact a function a, of the relations. So like a baby is a function of the parents' sexuality. Uh, the relationship gives birth to the individual. And in the case of a couple, the relationship gives birth to, to their couplehood. And if we focus on the qualities of the couplehood, of how they interact with each other and the patterns they create that are sustainable, uh, then the individual's inside world changes because they now live in a new environment and all of our internal world, which is basically simply memories and our imagination. That's all that's inside us is memory and imagination. No matter what, what is in there as a memory, could be platonic theory, could be whatever you've thought about. It's still a memory. And it came into you from the outside, from our interaction with the outside. So our inner world is a world of memory. And then we also have this capacity to imagine so we can generate uh, new things inside us. But that's about all the brain does is remember and imagine <clears throat> and turn the imagination into, into action. So when you change the out, and all of us are shaped by our interaction with the outside world. I, I noticed, I heard the other day, I read two amazing articles, John, that was uh, totally outside the realm of mental health and couples which said, that people who live in mountains, their consciousness and their characters are changed by the mountains, by the environment. Uh, and then there were two or three other articles on the environmental impact on the shaping of the self. Still talking about the interactive space so that what is the environment we live in creates the world that inhabits us on the inside. So in a marriage or in intimate partnership or in a school or in a business or wherever we are, the environment we live in is the source of the memories that we uh, look at the world through and that those memories become the basis of our imagination. So, and we can imagine things beyond our memories, but our imaginations are always a, built on top of, off of and transcend our memories or not. Sometimes our imagination simply re recreates the memories, but it can also create new memories. But that's really the important thing to know. And we say to couples, we say to individuals, how you interact with each other will change the way you are inside. And if you have healthy interactions, you will actually develop a healthy inner world because uh, you'll have great memories. And then you'll feel better, you'll be excited, you'll be joyful. And if you have negative then you'll have memories of pain and suffering and anxiety, and that will be your life. So it's, it's a choice. How do I want, I tell, I tell Helen all the time, I'm interested in, because <clears throat> whatever I do with Helen in our interactive space will become a memory in her mind of me. And if I'm negative, Helen's going to, she can't help but record it. She's got this recorder, it runs all the time. Everybody's got this recorder that runs all the time, records everything that happens. So if I do a negative transaction and leave, and then I come back into Helen's space, her brain is sitting with that memory and she will anticipate that I will maybe do another one, but she's certainly gonna watch and see. <laughs> Whereas if I left the room and was just excited and just hugged her and said, I can't wait to see you again. And we're going to have such a great time. And you're such a wonderful partner. When I come back in the room, her brain is going to say, well, I might get some more of that. Um, it'll, it's, it'll still notice. Am I still in that mood? But the anticipation will be, it'll be better. So we are in charge of the memories our partners have of us. So when they react to us like uh, negative, we created their disposition to look at us in that way. If they respond to us with great excitement, that's because we related to them in such a way they have a memory and they associate that excitement with us. The brain does this automatically. Now, Helen's, Helen's consciousness can rise up above all that and say, look at what's going on here. But 
she has to do that intentionally. The autom automatism is that it happens like that all the time, unless you notice it and say, well, even though he was pleasant last time when he came in, I think I'm going to be critical of him when he shows up next time. But she has to decide to do that. If she doesn't interfere with the process, it'll be automatic. Go ahead, Helen. So Coach John, is it okay if I make a comment about- Of course. And then Krista wants to ask something too okay. about, par about parenting, but go ahead, of course. Okay, let me finish up then on, because I don't want to interrupt your questions. No, but no. You mentioned bad and healthy habits. I just want to say that what I think is the most important thing to say to any couple is guess what? You have, the, the brain is the most, they say the most complex, complex organ in the universe. Like it's very, very complex. I mean, the brain is amazing and the universe is amazing, but the brain is something that like, who, who, where did this come from? And why does it work the way it does? How can it like create symphonies and come up with all these ideas? I mean, the brain's amazing. So there's a lower brain, which keeps you alive. Thank goodness, it wants <clears> to protect you. And we call that part of the brain, the crocodile brain. It's called the reptilian system that it, it keeps you alive. It protects you, it, 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 it works to keep you safe. There's another part of your brain that's the wise owl, the, the person that could come up with new ideas, um, uh, innovative solutions to things, curiosity and wonder, all sorts of things. So, so we, the way we do our teaching, Coach John, uh, almost to anybody these days is coach them in brain training. Are you living your relationship in the lower brain where you're self-protecting and you're trying to survive? And if someone is dangerous, you want to run? Well, that leads to divorce if you live in the lower brain. And we train with the training we do, that's a bad habit. Do not listen to the lower brain completely. You might, you might, it, the lower brain might get your attention, but the dialogue process gives you sentence stems. And if you do those sentence stems, you'll get in the habit of going to the upper brain, which is the wise owl. And the wise owl, instead of wanting to react to their partner, with anger and frustration, you, you know, you should have said that, you know, I, <laughs> and you said it again, and da, da, da. shame on you. <laughs> Not, that's a bad habit. Don't <clears throat> talk that way to your partner, to your child, and your children should not ever talk to you from the crocodile brain. Everyone in your family should speak from the wise <clears throat> owl. And the first thing you do is say, let me see if I've got it. Did I hear you correctly when you said so and so? And well, is there more about that? If that's what you think, is there more about that? And first listen, and that's the beginning of the three steps of dialogue that you well, listen. That was one of the things I was going to ask you: is what would you, what would be the most important thing uh, to to teach couples now, especially couples getting married? But I just want to go to Chris. She had a question, I think, off of uh, Harbo's there about uh, parenting. Well, it, it really ties into what you're saying as well, Helen, because I think about, and Harwell, you're talking about how we remember the person as they come back from a situation is in our memory. And oh. children are absolutely like that. And so it's essential, I think, for parents to think about, okay, how am I speaking to my children? And of course, we all lose our temper and we get upset and, you know, we might yell at the kids or whatever. And, and thinking about, okay, I, I have to put it in perspective of grandchildren. I think, okay, how am I speaking to my grandkids? Am I being harsh? Am I being kind? Am I being patient? Am I being curious? Because if that's how they remember me as they walk back into the room after they go out to play, that's what I want. So it really becomes so essential for parents to think about how to create a safe environment for, for the children. And so I think your safe conversations are not just for couples, they're, they're across the board. It's for families, for children, for businesses even, because I think about how um, when children get bullied in school and the, ch the child is blamed, I, I don't think it's the child. 
I think that somewhere they are not feeling safe and they, that is the memory they carry into their daily life. And right. so they then become the bully. Yep. So right. your couples, kids, <clears throat> do it with kids, do it at work, do it everywhere. Absolutely, Crystal. And, and so to, to wrap up my, my point <clears throat> is that uh, you create bad memories and you're in the lower part of your brain. Yes. And we have a Catholic daughter that we are not, we are not Catholic, but our daughter converted to Catholicism and she loves safe conversations and she loves zero negativity. And guess what, Crystal? It's not just the way she talks to her kids. She insists that her kids talk from the wise owl to her absolutely transaction if they don't they have to leave the table they have to go stand in the corner until they can compose themselves and come back and speak from the upper brain if they're if any of her children are frustrated with her they immediately she will not listen to a frustration she will listen to a frustration if it's with a request and if it's made with a kind tone of voice. Her kids, she she doesn't give them dessert and they get no allowance unless they use zero negativity. So it is both ways. And the, so this is my last comment. So Coach John, all of this is brain training. And if you live in the part of the brain that the dialogue process takes you, it's the wise brain, dialogue and zero negativity everything you're up here creating positive memories <clears throat> and the science has just shown that when uh, any person anyone in the listening audience is being thoughtful about how they respond to other people and they move from reactivity into a process where they're curious about why that other person feels that way before they respond that number one mayo science says People in healthy relationships live longer. Number two, they don't get sick as much. And number three, they have healthier immune systems to defend against COVID. So we are these days, um, Coach John, um, branding and marketing uh, safe conversations is brain training. Okay. And oh. Get out of bad habits. Like every single day, practice, practice, practice. Like oh, that's the coaching, yeah. What are, talk about talk a bit about zero negativity, Harville. Uh, say again. A zero ne zero negativity. What was the question about? Well, speak to that. What? Because I know that's been a fairly recent. I think where you you really have focused on that, and to me, it just makes a lot of sense. Well, it's recent that we focused on it in public, but it's old in our own relationship because, as Helen said, we almost got a divorce which is now 20 years ago that we- I thought it was a 2000, uh, 2000 when you guys got back together in Detroit. I remember that, yeah. That's right. And then we had a, uh, a recommitment on uh, the New Year's Eve in 1999. So we came, went into the year 2000 with, with a new uh, commitment, uh, both at the church and then a big celebration uh, party afterwards on, uh, on the Hudson in downtown New York on the river. And uh, when the uh, firecrackers went off celebrating New Year's, we were on the river and we could see them. And so we said, all of New York is celebrating. Our <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the least expensive, most elaborate uh, party anybody's ever had uh, around, around the recommitment. But we got to that uh, because about a year earlier, I think it was about 19, early 1999, we had decided that we were, we're going to give ourselves, you know, some time, eight or nine months, maybe a year to see what we could do. And then if we didn't make the relationship better, we would just divorce. And we got to the point where I had an apartment and looked like we were going to go, but we decided we would actually do some things. And so we dated. Uh, or we lived, we lived together in separate rooms, but then we had a date once a week for a day and we'd go into New York City. We lived in New Jersey at that time. And uh, we went to- Because a, the divorce law, law, um, laws were better 
in New Jersey. In New Jersey. So we, we went into uh, one of our days and uh, um, Helen said when we went to the bookstore, why don't we not go to the psychology section, but go to the astrology section, which was to totally uninteresting to me, except as an oddity. Um, but we pulled this book down that was about a thousand page book that had an essay about the pairing of each sign. So we turned to Helen's in February and me in September. It was astrology for couples. Astrology for couples to see what the essay was. How did these two people interact? And you want to tell what it said? Well, it said, uh, well, you're the least likely couple to make it. Your, your two horoscopes signed, they, they just collide. They don't, they don't get along. And uh, due to, and, and you probably can't, uh, don't tolerate each other very well due to the quote, unre unrelenting scrutiny you give one another. So, so we said, I mean, how, do, how do, was somebody, how was, somebody was watching us? Um, so, what, but the point of that was again, it's always interesting to me where an idea comes from. Uh, your brain's looking for solutions and, and here's something. So we said, and, and, and Helen here, Helen took the lead on dialogue in 1977 when she said, stop, one of us talked the other, listen. She took the lead on this and she said, why don't we uh, get a calendar and uh, see if we can get through a week without uh, having uh, a negative transaction? And the question was, can we get through a day? And so we had this calendar and we kept the calendar for three months before we actually had a day that we were not negative. And then the, the days- The definition of negativity is if the other person experiences it as negative. Yeah. You may not think you're being negative. <clears throat> But in, like I in, thought I was being helpful, right? But he thought it was negative. So anything she would experience as negative, we now call it a put down. Uh, that's like, what? Uh, why would you say that? Uh, where did an idea like that come from? Did you close the barn door? Um, anything that was a negation of the other. So we monitored all that. Or tone of voice. For about nine months. Look in the eye. And we found that we were at a point where we could recommit. And so three months later, we re remarried. We didn't actually ever divorce, but we, quote, remarried and, um, and with the ceremony and then the celebration party. So I brought uh, ne zero negativity into my practice and we began to move it into our couples workshops. Um, uh, but only about after a couple of years, because so, we sort of thought, well, that was, you know, fluke. That's what we did. It helped us, but I, I never, Harville was the one that brought it into the theory. I never thought he would, but, but, but and we learned to have fun. I learned to have fun. Because yeah, we, no we, 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 both of fun. us were fun impaired and we didn't know how to laugh and we got joke books and we started practicing having fun together and being silly. So I began to experiment just like I did with dialogue uh, in, uh, in the uh, early, uh, late seventies and early eighties, when we began to put that together, I began to experiment with asking couples uh, to uh, take a zero negativity pledge. We finally got that name uh, zero negativity so that it was something. Uh, we've learned from quantum field theory that nothing is anything until it's given a name. So we gave it a name zero negativity and gave it a definition. That means that you live with each other without putting each other down any way, shape or form. You know, like, huh, to a uh, raw, uh, raw criticism. All of that has to go. And we found that couples who took that seriously began to improve. And I began to, then we moved it from an experiment to a requirement that you have to signed and finally began to say to couples, there's no way in hell you're going to improve your life if you keep negativity in it. It's logically impossible to be close and feel safe and be negative because negativity creates anxiety, which means you're in danger and you will not feel safe and you cannot be intimate unless you feel safe. So that's so logical. But finally, it got clear to me that's so logical that anyone down in Georgia, we would say one-eyed and half brain could figure that out. You can't be close and negative at the same time. So the logic became the therapeutic process. And that, so we added that 
So people were now in dialogue and then they, yeah, go ahead, John, you're, you're muted. You're, you're, you're muted, John. We want to hear your brilliance. No, I, I've used that with, with couples and I, it's brilliant. I love it. The calendar. It's great. Anyway, Rosemary has a question she wants to ask. So I'll, 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 but thank you. That was great, Darbo. You're muted too. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, I thought I muted myself. Okay, thank you. Harbo, sorry, did you want to finish your thought before I ask my question or? No, go ahead. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, so I was just going to ask you, uh, I obviously work uh, as an event planner. Um, I have couples who are getting married and that. I'm just curious what advice you, you would give to couples starting out or rec I would think recommending your book and that, or are there other things that you, you would um, suggest that they do to, to start off in a healthy, you know, um, marriage and, and that? Yeah, well, I think that, <clears throat> um, that uh, if we had our way, uh, Helen has this thing she uses often is that she'd have, they'd have to go, when they go get their marriage license, they'd have to take a course. <laughs> like, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. like a driver's yes. license. Yeah. Yes. There are four things they'd have to do. And so we now have this little formula, which again, seems so logical uh, for making a great marriage. And the formula is you have to learn how to talk differently in such a way that you are safe with each other. And <clears throat> that's, the, that's the safe conversation process. And that has a structure to it. You have to learn that when you wanna talk, are you say, is it okay? You ask permission, is it okay to, to talk right now? Because Helen's running a movie in her mind all the time. And if I just walk in the room and start talking, <laughs> I'm walking into her movie house and putting my movie on her screen and she's gonna be irritated by that or because she's such a nice and wonderful person, she often says, oh, so you want me to watch your movie? I'll turn mine on off and watch yours. <laughs> uh, we, we both require that you ask me, is it okay to talk to me? Um, and all you have to do is say, are you available? And I can say, well, not right now, uh, but I will be in 10 minutes. I got to go to the bathroom or uh, yes, I'm available. I can switch off what I'm doing right now. Or actually, I'm in the middle of a paragraph. And every time I come out of this paragraph, it takes me an hour to get back into the middle of it. So can you come back in an hour when I finish this thought? And, and she'll say, well, yes or no, or something like that. But you, but you, but you learn how to talk. Safe conversations is defined this way. Talking without criticizing. That is really hard for people to do. Listen without judging. Like, what in the world is John saying? Where did he get that idea? I'm running that through my mind, even though I'm mirroring him back. And connecting, if you do those two things, then you can connect around and beyond your differences. And if you can't connect around your differences, you will never have a great marriage. It's the diversity of difference that makes a marriage great. It's the energy of the polarity. The second thing is you have to give up negativity. So the zero negativity pledge uh, is essential. And the third thing that we've added is practicing affirmation. And affirmation means that you say something positive to each other on a daily basis. Wow, what a great dress you have on this morning. Or that was a great biscuit you picked for breakfast. Or Thank you for touching my hand while we were walking or, or anything that just says you're in my world and I'm affirming your being here. You, it's sort of like uh, Martin Buber in the I Vow talked about affirmation is what makes others human. When I affirm your humanness, there's some, something, something about that, that transaction. And quantum physics says again, you aren't anything until you name it. So when I name you as being uh, great or wonderful or beautiful, I then am actually co-creating you. So you want to do the affirmation. And then to push it a little bit, uh, and takes up, this is probably a, this is a fourth point, that couples need to become empathic with each other. And by that, we mean empathy for what it was like to have been a child. 
And if I can say, God, it must have been really rough. And Helen can say to me, it must have been really challenging to you as a child for both your parents to die before you were six. So she knows that I have a, uh, a challenge from my childhood, which uh, we've given up the word wound because that seems too much too physical. Uh, we have a challenge. And it was with that, that important people leave me. So that's a sort of a childhood fear that important people will leave me. So she needs to know that so that she can feel empathic when I feel abandoned. Whether she uh, does something that makes me feel that way or somebody like there was a person in the in Imago, John, many years ago who came on really enthusiastically and then decided they didn't want to be a part of that, but they wanted all of Imago and then uh, take it off and do it on their own. This person was a great advocate and then became a great um, person who abandoned me. Um, this was a professional abandonment, but you know, only been two yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. I feel really, I feel really yeah. good that been abandoned twice. <laughs> but so you have those four things. And if you do those four things, you will have a great, there's no way you cannot have a great marriage. That's like, if you put that stuff in this recipe, you're gonna get a good pie. It always works. I want to cut you off one more time because uh, uh, Cynthia wants to say something too. And I just want to get her in there before we close. But thanks again, you guys. Go ahead. This is wonderful. You know, um, Harville and, and, and Helen, in, in your sharing and talking about your theories um, and, and your, um, you know, how, how you've gotten here and how it's evolved to, um, you know, things that resonate with me. We've had the pleasure to, to read your book, work with the book, do the exercises and be coached um, with, with John. So, um, you know, when, when our, our marriage was, was, was having problems, I knew, I knew where to turn and it was, it was beautiful to be able to do that. You know, so when we, when we met with John, um, we've learned, we learned so many things in that and a lot of it had to do with our childhood challenges. Um, that was really showing up in, in today's day and stopping things. And one of those big things for me was, was being the feeling of being dismissed and even the languaging. I mean, my husband uses the languaging of being irritated. And to me, that doesn't resonate with me. Irritated is not a word in, in, my, in my mind of dictionaries. It's more being upset. I'm not irritated, I'm, I'm ups, upset. So if he uses the word of irritation and I'm upset, I get even more upset because it's not validating my, my upsetness. So through the whole process working with John and our, and our activities, we've learned those differences and you know, being able to you know, have that change of behavior request, um, the positively uh, f uh, flooding from, from your book, that, that was a huge exercise that we did because hearing those words from my husband and being able to tell my husband those things without being interrupted or actually listening through the processes is, is huge. So I do recommend you know, for couples who are definitely um, you know, in, in the process of either struggling or for myself professionally being, um, you know, being a partner in business um, with 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 men, so I have I have four men that I'm a partner in business with. Sometimes we can be intimidated as women as well, and being able to use the dialogue um, that you have shared in in, in, in in the book that I've read has really um, extremely been helpful. So I thank you for that, and, and thank you, John, for everything that he has done. Oh, well, thank you very much. That was very luminous comments. I'm glad you chimed in there, and yes. I think you know, that, that another way to put it in terms of books is getting is a getting us the classic book but helen uh proposed some years ago another book that was shorter called making marriage simple which mm -hmm. takes the getting and turns it into a manual uh 10 things that you do which makes it accessible to people who don't want to read a lot uh, and just get it so or the 12 exercises in the back of getting just any anything that puts you into a structure of learning how to engage another person without negativity and how to affirm them so that you feel safe together. Then you'll have a great marriage. So that's what I would say to all people on the way to the altar. Uh, you don't know how to be in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Don't even imagine you know how to be in a relationship. Nobody knows how to be in a relationship. Unless they're taught. Unless they're taught. And it hasn't been teachable before. Yeah. So and that's the like... second thing, right? That Helen always reminds us of that, is the stuff that, that we now know. We didn't know, um, um, you know, Ever. 25 years ago. Ever. We've all emerged uh, in the relational sciences he, in the past 20 years. 
And what's emerged is that it has to be focused on the relationship. If you want a relationship, you have to focus on the relationship, not on you. Marriage is not about you. Marriage is about marriage. And, the and space if you are between. about your marriage, then you will be okay. Your marriage will take care of you. But if you take care of you, your marriage will suffer. And so will you, because you'll be, it's like we are all on the planet now. We've not taken care of the earth. So we're all suffering because we didn't take care of our relationship to our environment, to the context. Same thing in the smaller level in a marriage. If you take care of the marriage, it will take care of you. you I got to cut you off there, Harlow, because we're out of time. But I, I'm going to turn it over to Rosemary again. Thanks again. Very, very much. You guys are great. Thank you. We're just coming up to the last few minutes of the hour. Um, you are wonderful, um, Harville and, and Helen. The information you've given us is it, it's invaluable. Um, it's so practical. I've been listening to your, uh, your audio book and you're listening and think, oh my God. So it makes such good sense. And it's it's just very common sense. But yet we, you're right, we were never taught this. So, so important um to, it, like to know this and to have your resources and your expertise so we thank you so much uh we're, we're not going to leave you just yet we're just going to do a quick our uh, our um our uh, giveaway we're going to actually give away a copy of uh, their book um from us which is getting the the, the love you sorry i can't see it getting the love you want the love you want sorry uh just blank out there for a second anyways so we're going to do our spin we're uh, the spinning wheel. Here we go. Cynthia is going to tell us who the lucky winner is today. And uh, Cynthia has posted on our in the comment section how, um, oh, Richard Gordon, congratulations. You're lucky winner today. Thank you, Cynthia. So uh, Cynthia has posted in the comment section um, their website, their Facebook. Um, I think there's a couple websites. So if you, uh, where you can get in touch with both uh, Harville and Helen. I'm just gonna turn it over to Crystal one second. So please do check that out. Thank you everybody for joining us. Hold on one second, I'm gonna go over to Crystal. I, I just, I wanna say, it's so great to have both of you on the show and to, to see the two of you again. And I just, I just wanna say that we hardly touched on the space between Helen and I would love to have more of a conversation on the space between, I'm sure we could do a whole show on the space between. When John and I do the marriage prep, I, I'm the person that, that does the space between with the couples and I, I love it. I just think it's just so amazing. I did that too. And if you go to our website, safeconversation.com, yep. we have all sorts of, like you can uh, take level one training and learn to do this uh, at oh. yourself in your own life. And then if you do level two training, you can actually teach a workshop to other people. Perfect. Fantastic. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you we, so we much. We might not get you back 17 times, Harvard, but we might get you back. You and uh, Yeah, Helen. we would okay. love to have. I, I, there is so much uh, information and we would love to have you back again in the future if you are open to it. Um, I know that our viewers will have gotten a lot out of this, especially in these times um, during, you know, the pandemic. I know a lot of relationships are probably tested and tried. And um, so to have resources such as yourselves. We have a first aid kit for couples on our website. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Excellent. okay. All right. Excellent. excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining us again. Thank you so much. Um, Harvard and Helen, you are wonderful. We are beyond ecstatic to have had you on the show. Thank you. Um, this was really a dream having you guys here. And I know we've learned a lot and I know I'm sure everybody else has and just get their book, get on their websites um, because there are tools to help, to help you. Thank you to John for being our moderator today. You did an awesome job and thank you my host. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you back here next week. Take care.